Okay, everybody. Um, I'd like to welcome you to uh, this uh, webinar, which is hosted by Thoracis. My name is Leonard Lomblad. I will be your host today, and I will have a discussion with uh, Dr. Chang Wei Chao, who is our distinguished invited guest speaker for today. Um, so by way of introducing, uh, Chang Wei is an associate professor at the Institute of Medical Sciences at Toronto University. And she also got her degree, uh, medical degree from the University of Toronto and did a PhD in cell biology also at the University of Toronto. And uh, she then moved across the pond. Those were the days when you still could fly across the pond uh, to Germany. And she did a postdoc fellowship at the Max Planck Institute in uh, in uh, Baden Nauheim in, in Germany. Um, so currently uh, her research interests are essentially focused on two areas. One is about the inhaled pollutants and their effects on, on lung health and um, uh, the impact of traffic related pollutants uh, following lung transplant in correlation of these levels with ambient air pollutant and lung function and so on. She's done a, currently doing a, a large work up in Fort McMurray and Fort McKay First Nations to assess the effects of the Alberta wildfires on long-term lung health in the population there. But the topic for today's meeting is something that uh, got us connected and that is uh, studies comparing oscillometry with conventional pulmonary function tests. And this is in uh, the aim of early diagnosis of complications following lung transplant and for that matter bone marrow transplants. Um, and earlier this year, uh, Cheng Wei's group uh, published a, an interesting paper uh, comparing uh, oscillometry with uh, spirometry and a few other things. And uh, that's sort of the, the core of, um, of what we know today about oscillometry and its sensitivity for detecting early reje rejections. Uh, as an extension of this, he's also interested in machine learning for interpretation of lung function tests. So um, with that, uh, I would like to just remind people that, uh, let's see if I'm sharing my screen here correctly. Uh, you are, we saw it. it did. Yeah, I, guess I didn't see it. <laughs> so I just make sure here, okay. Um, that, the number of transplants worldwide, and this is by statistics from last year, uh, leading up to 2017, is you know somewhere around 4,500, uh, and uh, the mean median survival rate for a transplant uh, analysis and, and pediatrics is somewhere around six years. So, um, if there could be anything done in order to extend the survival, or if at least improve the, the um, uh, health and the well-being of these patients, uh, a lot would be gained. And um, so this is all the interesting background, I think, for why this is an important area to explore uh, in terms of early detection. So uh, we're now going to have a, a short presentation by Dr. Chang Wei Zhao, and uh, then we were going to have a bit of a discussion. Uh, and uh, Finally, we're gonna uh, invite uh, the audience to submit their questions. Um, please write your questions, and you can do that at any time in the chat room. They will be handled by, by uh, my colleague, uh, Ev Bissonnette at uh, Thoracis, and then forwarded to, to Cheng Wei and myself. So without further ado, Cheng Wei, uh, you can now share, share your screen and take it away. Thanks very much, Leonard. And, um... I'd like to thank all of you actually for, for signing in. I, I know some of you um, are signing in from Europe and I believe from Australia as well. So I very much appreciate the fact that uh, you're logging in. Um, are you able to see my screen now? Yes, uh, it's, yes, that's perfect. Thank you. Okay, perfect. So what, um, as Leonard had said, uh, what the, the plan is that I will talk over the next 10 to 15 minutes or so. And, and really what we really want to do today is really to have an ongoing dialogue in terms of where we think uh, oscillometry could be helpful in terms of management of lung disease. And today in particularly, uh, the topic is that of lung transplant patients. 
Um, I just want to sort of thank some of my funders uh, for supporting the research work that we have been doing over the past several years. And, and there are really three objectives over the uh, my part of the session over the next uh, 10 minutes. One is to uh, go over with you the concept of respiratory oscillometry and what it actually measures. And I will also very quickly review uh, what we know about the patterns of what we see in oscillometry with the common uh, lung diseases, what normal looks like, what the obstructive and the restrictive defect looks like, and how that figures into uh, assessment of patients after lung transplant. And then really spend a lot of time talking about and thinking through the potential of oscillometry in its use for management and research uh, in lung transplantation. So what is oscillometry? Uh, let me just start off uh, first but to say that it is not a traditional pulmonary function study. It does not require patients to blow up forcefully. It doesn't require to do them any specific maneuvers other than to breathe normally during, this, uh, during the assessment. It also doesn't measure flow and lung volumes in the same way that uh, what we're used to. What it does is that it actually superimposes uh, oscillatory pressures of different wavelengths on top of the patient's normal quiet breathing. And what we measure is actually the, the, the changes in the waveform uh, as a result of this. And through signal processing, what we're able to then do is actually do some, um, to, to actually get measurements of respiratory mechanics and the breathing pattern of the patients. And this is perhaps a little bit better illustrated in this, uh, in this slide here. So what we're doing here is uh, imposing wavelengths um, of different pressures of different wavelengths to the patient's uh, normal breathing pattern. And what we measure at the end of that are changes in the pressure and the flow. And, and through this, we're able to get to, to do the signal processing to get the information that we, we, we need to, met to um, assess for spider mechanics. And what oscillometry does is it takes advantage it's, it takes advantage of the different properties of the wavelengths so that the higher frequency wavelengths, the frequencies that are in, in the 20 Hertz and higher frequencies are able to, to traverse, but only traverse into the large airways in the medium sized airways. Whereas the lower frequency wavelengths, those that are in the five to 11 Hertz um, range are able to travel much further down into the lung and to reach the lung periphery in the small airways. And it is through this, partitioning of the analysis of the impedance of these pressure waves to flow through the lung that we're able to then assess the different regions of the lung with respect to its mechanical properties. And it is specifically this exquisite sensitivity to lung periphery that had made it very useful to the respiratory physiologist for the past half century. Um, the lung periphery in the small airways is a region of the lung that is not well assessed by conventional methods. And the other aspect of uh, oscillometry that has made it uh, sort of more popular, if you will, is the fact that it's, it's conducted under normal, normal tidal breathing. So you can do it on really young children, you can do it in elderly people, as long as that person is able to breathe they can do oscillometry. And it can also be done, obviously, in people with spirometry and uh, uh, body, body box measurements are contraindicated. But it really wasn't until the commercial availability of these of, uh, oscillometry devices became available about 10 years ago that, that it entered into the clinical realm. And as far as I know, um, there, there are six commercial devices available. The, um, the one that I'm most familiar with, and, and simply because it was the only one that was available uh, and was Health Canada approved when I began my studies here uh, in Toronto that uh, I, 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 my studies used the Tremoflow device. Now, in the last five, seven years, there has really been an explosion of publications that have looked at oscillometry in evaluation of lung function, particularly in the obstructive lung diseases. And it's pretty well accepted now that oscillometry is superior to conventional pulmonary function studies in terms of its ability to correlate with symptoms and to predict exacerbations of COPD. There has also been a number of studies that have shown that oscillometry is better than spirometry in the early diagnosis of 
uh, COPD and therefore potentially for better management of COPD by allowing for early treatment. Two really uh, terrific studies were published uh, last year. Um, one, one that came out of Canada, uh, which is the study on top. The st second study uh, was from the UK. And what both of these studies have in common is that not only did they compare oscillometry to conventional pulmonary function studies, but they also did functional imaging analysis. And in some of the other studies, they also looked at um, the uh, uh, symptom scores, as well as did computer modeling of the lung to actually correlate the findings of oscillometry with what they measured. And the take home message of these two studies is not just those three, these three points that I've I identified above, but the fact that one of the oscillometry parameters, specifically the R5 to 19, is a direct measurement of small airway uh, obstruction. Now, my group began our studies um, in lung transplantation in late 2017, where we prospectively uh, enrolled patients who were recently, who were just uh, transplanted to oscillometry in comparison with um, spirometry. And the specific endpoints that we were interested in looking at was biopsy proven clinically significant acute rejection and comparing those to biopsy proven no rejection. And the comparisons that we were interested in looking at was the comparison with the current gold standard method of uh, monitoring lung function, which is FEV1, with the oscillometry parameters of R5 to 19, AX and X5. This paper was published in the Blue Journal in uh, June this year, and it was accompanied by uh, an, an editorial. And I'm forever grateful for Dr. Usmani, whom I hadn't met uh, at that point, because not only did he provide us with the editorial, but he actually provided uh, a primer to the readers in terms of how to interpret pulmonary functions, uh, to, to interpret oscillometry. And this diagram here is an oscillogram that I have copied from his editorial. And what you see here is that the, what oscillometry does is that it actually partitions or it segregates the, the measurements of respiratory impedance into the values of resistance, which is shown here in the blue as it is plotted against the different frequencies at which oscillometry is measured. And the, the other um, metric that is used is the, the reactance value, again, plotted out against the frequencies uh, at which we measured. Now, if you were to take the, the lung as a single compartment model, it turns out that the resistance value is, is a metric of the airway caliber. So the narrower the airways, uh, the higher the resistance. The second aspect, the, this reactance value is, 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 is a metric of the tissue elastance and the capacitance of the lung. So the soft stuff, the parenchyma of the lung. And the, 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 the two metrics to keep in mind as I talk um, and go through the next couple of slides are these two metrics shown in, in red here, the R5 to 19, the, the difference between the resistance at five Hertz and the resistance at 19 Hertz, it is a a, a metric of small airway function. And so the, the more small area obstruction there is, the higher the uh, R5 to 19. It is also a measure of the inhomogeneity of ventilation in the lung periphery. The second value to keep in mind is this area, this thing called the AX or the area of reactance that is shown here as the area under the curve. It is a metric of the elastic properties of the lung and of, again, inhomogeneity of ventilation. The higher this value goes, the stiffer the lung and the more inhomogeneity in terms of ventilation. And these were the metrics that turned out to be highly significant in patients with acute rejection. So if we were to look here at these patients uh, uh, with acute rejection, shown here in the red, uh, and, and compare that to patients with no rejection in blue, what you see is that on the week of the biopsy, there is significant differences between the R5 to 19, between rejection and no rejection. More remarkable though, is the fact that this, the, these differences were beginning to be evident the week before the biopsy, before the, the diagnosis was made. We see the same pattern with the AX value, so that this is significantly higher in people with acute rejection versus those with no rejection. Again, this was seemingly evident the week before. In contrast, 
if you were to look at the FEV1, what is still the gold standard um, monitoring metric for lung function post-transplant, what you see is that in, the, in, in, in these red patients, uh, the patients with acute rejection, you would have actually thought that they were getting better because it looked like their, their FEV1 was actually improving. The other thing that we noted was that once the patients had been treated for their acute rejection, what you saw was that there was a reduction or an improvement in the lung mechanics. So a reduction in the R5 to 19, two weeks after the, the acute rejection episode. Most of the patients would have been treated sort of around seven days after, um, after the biopsy results, but after the biopsy occurred because that, was, that would be when we got the results back. We see the same thing here that the AX also improved, dropped down to, to actually values that were very comparable to patients who had no rejection. And again, if you were to just look at the FEV1 uh, values in, the same in these patients, you would think that these patients were doing really well. And in fact, if you come from a center where uh, routine transplantal biopsies are not done, you would have missed these episodes uh, of acute rejection altogether. And so what we concluded from this study was that oscillometry and specifically the measurements of R5 to 19 and AX tracked graft injury that was associated with acute rejection and was able to track its recovery after treatment of acute rejection. Now, we, we subsequently, the, the, that paper was published and based on data that was collected up until March um, of 2019. Uh, we've subsequently uh, been able to follow patients and have increased our enrollment. And th these, 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 these findings have held true as we have collected more and more cases of acute rejection and, and no rejection. And in this slide, I, I just want to sort of briefly, uh, you know, go over with you what the patterns of um, health and disease look like in oscillometry, and to really to drive home the point that even though um, oscillometry may be unfamiliar to many of us, it actually it follows the same principles as interpretation of pulmonary function studies and looking at pattern recognition in terms of the flow volume loops. And here, instead of looking at flow volume loops, what we're looking at is the resistance frequency and the reactance frequency curves. And after having sort of spent the last three years and, uh, and I guess maybe two and a half years uh, looking at about uh, several thousand of these, I've come to to sort of uh, to, 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 to the conclusion that I can derive, I can segregate these, these patterns. Um, so a healthy oscillogram is one that is on the straight and narrow. So the resistance um, curve is, is, is flat and it's low. The reactance curve is also relatively, it's got a little bit of a curve to it, and, but it, it, it's pretty well nice and straight. In a restrictive pattern, uh, the resistance value it is very much like that of a, of a healthy subject, but the reactance curve, remember that reactance is a reflection of the uh, of lung elastance of capacitance. It's it shifted, it shifted down and it shifted right to the right. So you can see that in comparison with the healthy uh, reactance curve, this one is shifted to the right and the value is a little bit low. Now, in the obstructive patterns look a little bit different uh, depending on where, where, whether this is primarily uh, bronchitis or emphysema, but they look sort of like horns or a trumpet. And so if they look like they're blowing at you, they're blaringly bad, then that's an obstructive pattern. And in fact, um, you know, once you, you sort of see a lot of these, you can recognize these patterns really quickly. So here, in, for example, is a patient, uh, it's a lung transplant patient who, who has now developed a boss. And you can see that this is a, has a trumpet pattern. So this is blaringly bad, and this is obstructive in, 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 in its uh, pattern. And the other thing to note is that most of, the, uh, most of the commercial devices will give you the reference values so that you can actually interpret these results in comparison with a healthy subject. Um, so this is the upper limit of normal here in the dotted graph for the resistance uh, curve and the lower limit of normal for the reactants. And these are, are based on the reference values that, was, that were published in 20, uh, 2013. And the specific metrics of interest is also, um, you know, as they are being outputted by the device, also provide you with uh, the reference values of what is normal for that particular uh, patient population. So 
where do I see the role of oscillometry in clinical practice? I think a lot of this uh, in terms of how it enters into the clinical realm, uh, maybe at the end of the day hinges very much on the way that uh, medical procedures and, uh, and, and practices are remunerated. In Canada, um, you know, our healthcare system is completely publicly funded. Oscillometry is not yet part of our uh, armamentarium of, of diagnostic tools that is actually paid for, but I know that in other jurisdictions it is. And, 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 and so thinking about oscillometry in terms of its role in clinical practice is that does it help us in terms of making a diagnosis earlier or for a further position? Does it allow us to actually uh, prognosticate, get better? And does it allow us to actually follow patients um, and, and to be able to, to look at disease progression a little bit better? And I will argue that probably um, from the cost benefit of comparing the different types of pulmonary function studies, um, there, there may be actually a cost benefit to doing uh, oscillometry com compared to conventional pulmonary function studies because a full uh, study, uh, uh, oscillometry takes us less than a 15 minutes to do in comparison to you know, 40 minutes or more for a full set of conventional pulmonary function studies. From the basis of the work that I've done and from the data that we've collected, I, I think that uh, in the context of lung transplant, that uh, oscillometry is actually an excellent screening tool, better than spirometry in terms of an early warning system for danger. It tells us, it alerts us that there's something wrong with the graph that should uh, initiate other investigations to, under, to, to identify the underlying cause. There is a potential that Oscillometry could be used as a marker of therapeutic response. Um, you know, as some of you know, most of you are likely in lung transplant. You know that there have not been many new treatments used for management of lung transplant. And part of it has to do with the fact that we don't have really good markers to tell us whether or not um, these, these therapies are actually uh, helping in terms of improving uh, patient um, outcomes. And there's also potential that oscillometry could allow us to detect uh, Clad early. Uh, the way that CLAD is diagnosed now is that by the time that, CLAD, that diagnosis of CLAD is made, it is already too late because by definition, it is an irreversible condition. From the point of view of um, where oscillometry could fit in terms of general astrology, I, I think that it has an excellent role in terms of screening for lung disease. Um, in any setting where there's a high potential for, uh, for underlying unrecognized lung disease. And it likely has a role. I, I'm sure, in fact, I know that it has a role um, in speaking with colleagues in the management and following uh, and the follow up of patients with asthma and COPD. And really what you, I, I think that from the point of view of screening is that, you know, you, you, what we're looking for is, you know, patients who are on the straight and narrow, right? So it looks like the, if when the oscillogram looks like that and you think, okay, great, this is good. But if anything that looks bad, well, then it's time to refer and to refer for further investigations or for uh, further management with the respirologist. So I will stop here and uh, we'll, uh, entertained questions, I believe, in Richard, uh, initially from Leonard, and then hopefully from uh, many of you. Yeah, uh, yeah. thank you very much, Angwei. Um, so um, I will just take the opportunity here because, you know, we've got some questions coming in, and uh, I would just encourage people to, to type in your questions into the chat room. And um, let them flow in and, and uh, we'll address them as they, they come in. So uh, just, just to, to sort of clarify this, um, what kind of information do you really get from oscillometry that they can't get from spirometry? No, given that there's a sensitivity difference, but, but, but what else is the really the big difference? Well, I think it's a it's a combination of things. Um, number one is that, and, and I'm going to confine my answers um, to the lung transplant population um, at this point because this is sort of the topic of um, of what we're talking about. Uh, but I'm happy to to expand that uh, if 
there are any follow-up questions. I, I think one of the advantages of oscillometry is the fact that it can be done by people, but uh, is the fact that it's done under normal tidal gradient. And so in the in the post-op phase, there, you know, in lung transplant, there, there is chest pain, there's chest discomfort, there is um, there are there's pleurofusion. A lot of the patients that I follow are very debilitated prior to transplant and um, are not significantly improved in terms of their physical conditioning within the first one or two months post-transplant. And, and so these patients, and with these patients, we can do oscillometry on them and following, and, and, I, and I also want to make, make the comment though, that oscillometry is really easy, but we still have to, to follow really good quality control guidelines in terms of its conduct. But if we do that, we can actually get very accurate measurements of respiratory mechanics in these patients very early on post-transplant. And I will also make the argument, and I would be very interested in hearing the lung transplant respirologists or lung transplant docs uh, on this call uh, about, uh, in terms of what I'm about to say is, I would posit that the lung in its initial sort of few weeks post-transplant is at its best function at time of transplant. And, it, and, and that as, it, as we progress over time, that lung gets injured because of infection and acute rejection. And I think that oscillometry as a, will give you a baseline value of how good that transplanted lung is from its get-go. And we don't get that information from, from, from spirometry because spirometry is effort dependent. There are some very old publications that have looked at the spirometry, look at changes in FEV1 and FEC over time. And, and it takes anywhere between six to 18 months before patients reach their peak value. And we colloquially, lung transplant uh, physicians colloquially say, well, you know, this, this lung is improving. But I will, sort of, I, I will argue that may, maybe it's not the lung that's improving, it's that the fact that the patient is improving. They're no longer in pain. They're, they're actually, their the muscle strength is improving. So the FEV1 and FEC is actually a reflection of the overall physical status of the patient rather than the status of the lung itself. Okay, thank you. Um, so um, one thing that a lot of people have asked us um, you know, now during this past more than half year living with COVID-19, what, what are the issues <coughs> using or doing lung function testing in general, but in particular with, with oscillometry? Is it okay? Is it safe to use? Uh, what are the issues? What precautions have you taken to, to address uh, the situation? Yeah, I, you know, as you know, and as many of, uh, I'm sure as everyone uh, on this call knows, I mean, there, there is very little data uh, regarding aerosol generation during the conduct of pulmonary function testing. And so we, you know, I think everyone has taken a very conservative approach in terms of how we do it. Um, our lab closed uh, completely um, in March. Uh, but we have reopened in phases and we are now, uh, we have been at full capacity um, in, since, since September. And the, I, I think you can argue that regardless of whether, you know, oscillometry or conventional pulmonary function studies um, generate a lot of aerosol or not. And I, I, I have some, 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 some sort of information to, to suggest that it, it's not an aerosol generating procedure. The, the fact that oscillometry is conducted under normal tidal breathing uh, decreases the risk of spirometry induced cough. And so the, there, there is this, this uh, potential that you know, it, it actually de decreases the risk to the technologists and to other patients. The, the way that our lab has taken um, to, 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 to monitoring, uh, to conduct of pulmonary function studies uh, now is we, we wear uh, PPE, we do not wear N95 masks, uh, but we, we, we do shields, we do uh, surgical masks, and we, we do uh, a screening uh, for, for, for COVID, but, but we do not require an, a negative COVID test before patients are booked in and come in for, for, for testing. And knock on wood, um, there have not been any positive cases uh, you know, since we resumed. And we are now, at, you know, we've been functioning at full, full capacity for the past two months. Well, I guess that's encouraging for 
whoever asked that question. Um, so I got a question here coming in. Um, uh, I see that there's a remarkable difference of parameters between the deceased lung and recovering lung. However, the factor cannot be just the resistance and compliance alone in a lung transplant. For example, reflux plays uh, a lot of role in children's lung transplant, which got embedded by uh, fundification. So is there a causal relationship between the airway dynamics and wellness of the new organ? Goodness. Um, I'm not sure I completely understand that question. Um, may I ask if whoever asked that question to, to unmute and... Uh, yeah, if you'd like to, please go ahead. Or maybe he or she needs permission to, to, to unmute. Uh, I'm not sure how this works. Uh, well, um, can you try that question again slowly? <laughs> okay. Um, so so uh, the question is about, uh, do, do we have somebody uh, talking here? I thought I heard some noise. Let's see, there's a chat here. Uh, um, uh, no, I don't see anything here. All right, I'll, I'll try to re read it again. Uh, Ev says she can't find the person who, who asked, asked the question. So, but there's a lot of people on board here. So uh, the, the factor cannot just be that the resistance and compliance alone uh, changed is the, really the question. So is there a relationship between the aerodynamics and the wellness of the new organ? So uh, I think the dynamics of the, the new organ is of course, I think gonna be primarily the new organ and not so much the patient, but this could also be a patient, you know, other than the new organ playing in, such as a reflux, for example, or, or other issues. I think that's what, what uh, the, the question is about. Okay, um, so I'm not gonna, I, I'm not sure I'm gonna be able to answer this uh, question correctly and, um, uh, or completely. So uh, whoever has asked, please, uh, please, please jump in. Um, but, but so oscillometry measures respiratory mechanics um, and it is, in some respects, um, agnostic to the underlying problem. So it, it is a measurement of the airway and the lung tissue, and to some extent, obviously, to the, to the chest wall as well. And so as things, uh, as the time post-transplant post proceeds, the injuries to the lung, whether it comes from infection, whether it comes from reflux, whether it comes from a, um, acute rejection, is identified by oscillometry. And, 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 and what we look for um, in our assessment of patients is look, look for the, the patient's changes over time so that we're not really looking at the comparison of the oscillometry findings with the normal control values that, that are available. And what seems to be in, in the studies that we have and in, in the analysis that we have done with our cohort, um, it would seem that the best oscillometry measurements um, in terms of the best lung mechanics occurs very early on. And, and that our initial measurements um, are usually the ones where, the pay, where, where we find like the, the best uh, respiratory mechanics. What I can tell you is that when we uh, when we started our study, the the usual our, our protocol in Toronto for lung transplant patients is that most patients are in hospital anywhere between fourteen to, to, to twenty one days. They're discharged from hospital, and then it's the first measurement of lung function occurs with a first first um, post discharge clinic visit, which is usually between three to four weeks post transplant. And when, we, when our initial analysis indicated that it seems that the graph was really, from, from, from oscillometry was really good, what we began to do was we actually started to, uh, to, to do oscillometry on patients uh, just before they were discharged so that we had one earlier time point uh, for evaluation, even though we didn't have spirometry to go with it. 
you know, unfortunately, we, we, we had ethics uh, approval to, to do this starting, I think it was in early 20, 2020. And so we don't have a whole lot of measurements on, the, on, on these folks before we were, we were shut down by, by COVID. Yeah, I think this actually segues nicely into another question I had here. Um, based on the rather large variability in the data you presented, do you think you would be able to predict rejection on an individual basis? I guess that really ties into what you just said, you know, if you have a baseline, uh, how much of a change do you need to see in order to make the call that it's time for bronchoscopy and actually confirm that there is a rejection, alternatively an infection going on? Yeah, you know, that, that's, a, that's a terrific question. And, and I think that one of the things that we are hoping to do um, over time uh, with sort of an increasing uh, patient population um, is to be able to define some thresholds. Um, and specifically what we want to do is to be able to, de to define a threshold value of a good graph. So uh, uh, a graph that has no rejection on biopsy, no infection um, you know, at the time of bronchoscopy. And to be able to sort of define that in terms of either the AX values that are R5 to 19 values and, and sort of say, okay, you know, this, this, is, um, this, is, this is a healthy graph and we don't need to do any further investigations because the, the protocol in Toronto is that we, we biopsy uh, everyone um, on a, as part of our standard protocol. And, and part of the reason for doing that is, and as I think many of the, the, the folks in the audience know, is that even though the FEV1 is a gold standard, we know it's a lousy gold standard. And, and, and so, so um, so we do the biopsies because we, we are very conservative and, and we don't want to miss these cases, but we, but we also recognize that, you know, there is risk associated with doing these procedures to the patient and doing the biopsies. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and, you know, further along, you know, with sensitivity and specificity, I guess, is, um, you know, trying to work out if there's been a significant change also depends on repro reproducibility, right? So in at least for spirometry, there could be pretty large reproducibility problem in, in patients with poor uh, health and, and I guess poor conditions in general. Um, so what is it like in the transplant population and can you comment more widely on this? This person, so, by the way, say it was a great talk. So congratulations. I'm sorry? This question also ended by saying great talk, by the way, so oh, well, thank you. To you. <laughs> well, I, I think there, there are two things. I, this is a very interesting question. It's one that I, I, I have, uh, it's a discussion that I have with my, my statistician on a, a actually fairly regular basis in terms of the sensitivity and specificity of, of oscillometry and, 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 um, and actually uh, spirometry. So, uh, so let me just sort of first off say again that, you know, oscillometry and in fact, uh, conventional pulmonary function studies are agnostic. They can't really tell you what the underlying disease is. And, and so what um, I think the value of oscillometry over spirometry is that the fact that it is way more sensitive than spirometry at identifying that there is something wrong with the graph. And that information is really helpful because as transplant respirologists, we need to make sure that patients do not have an active infection because that's the one that's fatal. That, that, that is the one thing that will be fatal. Um, so when we know that there's something, if you, we can identify early that there's something wrong with the graph, it would prompt investigations, which in most cases for all of us would mean a bronchoscopy, imaging, and other lab tests so that we can, differentiate between infection versus acute rejection. And none of us would treat uh, rejection. None of us would actually blast patients with more immunosuppression until we've ruled out and treated infection. So that's where I think that it, it is very, very useful. The other, the other question in terms of specificity, and this is where I often get into arguments with my statistician, is that spirometry, um, it, the, 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 the studies I know of that have looked at spirometry in terms of specificity for, for, for acute rejection, uh, and this is a, these are really old studies. I think it, this dates back, if I recall correctly, to 1997 or something like that. 
shows that specificity of biopsies uh, of uh, conventional primary function studies is 57%. So like that's sort of like 50-50. Um, and and, to, and I, I think to, to ask oscillometry to be specific for acute rejection is asking a, a diagnostic test to do something that it cannot. It cannot di diagnose. Um, acute rejection from infection. And what I actually, what I can tell you is that I, I have the data where we have looked at the values of oscillometry for people who have acute rejection um, versus people who have no rejection but have a clinically significant infection. So A0 biopsies, but BAL uh, proven, cultured, positive. Those, those, those parameters look the same. And what that tells me is that the, you know, it. Oscillometry can tell us what a, what a normal graph looks like or what a healthy graph is. It can also tell us what this is, you know, this, this graph is, is being injured and do something about it and investigate it. Um, no, I, I agree with you. It's the agnosticity of, of a measurement technique is kind of interesting <laughs> way of putting it, but it's true. Um, so another question I've got here, um, uh, it's, it seems to be very helpful and easy for patients and doctors to, to do the examination. Um, and this sort of segues into another question I received previously here. And it's, it's usefulness for, for uh, other diseases. I mean, is there a chance that it will become some kind of gold standard uh, for procedures in diagnostics, um, for example, CPD? I, my, my prediction um, is that it will, uh, and it is my hope that it will do so during the course of my uh, lifetime as a, as a, as a respirologist. The, and, and, but in order for us to do that, we do need more publications. We do need more normative values. Uh, to, to be published and to, to become known. I, I can tell you, I mean, you know, thank you for that introduction, uh, but, you know, we, we've been doing a number of other studies looking at different patient populations who are not lung transplant patients. And um, it is certainly our hope and our theory that oscillometry identifies disease much earlier. There, there have been a number of publications that have already shown this. Um, and, and because of the way that uh, and because oscillometry is easy to do, um, and because some of the devices um, are small and portable, you can take those into work sites and you can take those to different areas so that people don't really need to come into a, a homely functional laboratory. Uh, you don't really need the, 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 the skill sets of a well-trained technician to do spirometry. And so as, as an example, uh, when I go to Fort McMurray and Fort Mackay, and for those of you who are not Canadian, uh, Fort McMurray and Fort Mackay are really in the middle of nowhere. They, they are 350 kilometers away from a major center, um, actually from a major city. Uh, it's 200 uh, kilometers away from any other city. It's, it's in the oil patch. And uh, when we go out there, we actually fly everything with us. So we bring our oscillometer, we bring our supplies with us. And on one occasion when they sort of misplaced our supplies uh, on transport, I mean, we were sort of up the creek until they, they, they um, you know, they, 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 they found it because there was, there's no other source uh, uh, of, uh, of medical care or the clinics. And so you can sort of, Think about oscillometry as being a really useful setting. So in natural disasters, in occupational exposures, you can take these to, um, you know, to, to people's workplaces and actually evaluate patients. The other thing that I think it might be helpful for is in the emergency room settings where, you know, if you're having patients who are coming in uh, with acute exacerbations of COPD or if they're coming in for other diseases where there's a high likelihood that they might actually have underlying COPD, so patients with cardiac disease, um, they might be discharged home within a day or two in the emergency department. But if you're actually able to go in and screen them for underlying lung disease and to diagnose unrecognized COPD, you may actually be improving and you, you could refer them, right? Once you know that there's a problem, you can refer them on to, to specialist care and you may be able to decrease the number of readmissions to hospital or to the emergency department. 
so if, if I interpret it correctly, if you had no limitation monetary otherwise, uh, would you actually send a, an oscillometry home with your patient? You would give them a thermal flow and say with instructions and, and then uh, somehow have telemetrically the, the data forwarded to you? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, so uh, our program, um, and I'm sure that that is the same with all the other lung transplant programs the world, around the world, is that patients um, must have a spirometer, a home spirometer at the time that they are at the time of discharge. Now, so our patients have um, buy their own spirometers um, and they're asked to actually monitor themselves on a daily basis. And one of the things that had, that we've learned through the early phase of the pandemic when we weren't able to do pulmonary function testing is that patients are not really very good at doing home monitoring. And we have, you know, our patient, the, the lung transplant population is probably the most savvy um, uh, of, of pulmonary patients because they're so used to having, being tested on a regular basis and, and being told how to do spirometry that you would think that they would actually be very good at doing home, home spirometry. But one of the things we've learned during this pandemic when we've been following most of these patients virtually since March is that we're missing things by, by asking patients to do home spirometry. And so uh, that would be the job of uh, Thoracis and all the other companies uh, that, that have uh, oscillometers is to, to actually reduce the size and reduce the price so that they, they are on par uh, with those of spirometers so that patients can monitor themselves at home. And I think we would be able to, uh, we would be doing, I, I, I think that we would be doing the patients a favor and be able to provide better care for these patients if we can actually monitor their lung function much more sensitively. Yeah, I think it sounds like it would, would make sense because of the greater sensitivity and ease of use with, with the oscillometry over spirometry. So, yeah. Um, Let's see, we get another question here. Yes, there's one here. Um, it's a more technical question. Uh, what is the difference in significance between X5? We're talking reactants here. So now the point, the first point, the lowest frequency X5 and AX, which is the area of the reactance curve. What does these two different one tell us? Yeah, so the, a, the X5 um, is, it, it, it is a very good metric, actually, of small airway obstruction, and it's a very good metric of um, the elastance of lung. And, but one of the problems with the X5 is that it is subject to, um, to, to, to the respiratory pattern. And so what AX tries to do is actually to, um, to because AX is measured over the multiple frequencies, AX is essentially, um, and if you will allow me to sort of share my screen, um, AX, um, are you seeing my screen now? Um, a AX is, is, is this area between the X5 and- uh, we, we, we can't see your screen, so- We can't see my screen. Nope. Um, let me just try again. Uh, are you seeing that now? Yes, now we are. And you're seeing the, the oscillogram? Yep. Okay. So the AX is, is this area between the X5 and um, actually you, normally the frequency of resonance is somewhere, uh, if it's healthy, somewhere between sort of 10 and 12. So this AX value and maybe better shown here um, in, 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 this, in, in this area here. So is that it, 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 it's a much more stable measurement. And, and so, uh, so that is a metric that some people, um, some, some, some of my colleagues in, in, who have been studying this mostly in the COPD and asthma realm have identified or are proposing as the metric that uh, will differentiate uh, COPD from, uh, from those with, without. But what you can see here, so this is actually a patient with, uh, with emphysema and what you see here is that the AX value, like the AX values um, is, is really high, but the X5 value is really, really low. And this really represents the emphysematous part of the lung. Uh, 
versus here, this is, this is a patient who has chronic bronchitis without emphysema. And you see that the AX value is, is also high, but the X5 value uh, is not as low. So the lower the X5 value, the worse the, 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 the elastance of the lung. What I can tell you is that in, the, in our patient population, in the, in the lung transplant patient population, X5 was also uh, abnormal, uh, was lower, than the patients who had uh, no rejection, but it just missed being statistically significant. And, and I suspect that the reason for that was that we just didn't have enough uh, patient numbers. I hope that was, uh, that answered the question. Thank you. Yeah, I, I could just add a little snippet to this and that if nothing else, so for mathematical reasons, um, just integrating over the whole uh, stretch of the curve will actually increase the, um, the, the sensitivity of the measurement. So yes, uh, makes a lot of sense. <clears throat> One thing that uh, people have been wondering about is also how important it is to have normal reference data. And, and my thinking is, does it even apply to somebody who doesn't really have their own lung, if you know? I, I think there the, the, this is sort of a, a double answer. I, I think it's it's important. To, um, it, it, it's only in the sense that it's, it's it's important to have the normal reference values to to help guide you, so that if your first measurements of your measurements uh, initially tell you that you know if it looks like those patterns are glaringly bad uh, oscillo oscillograms, then, then I think you, you, you should look at that and say, I, I think we have a graph, we, we have a problem with this graph. And, and, you know, those of you who, the, the lung transplanters know, um, that there, there are the, some patients where we never achieve good lung function on these folks, um, you know, the, the blood patients. And so the, the, I, I think if your, your first measurement is uh, of these patients um, is, is looks bad on oscillometry, uh, these patients probably have a very bad graph and probably their outcomes are, are not very good. I, I think what's what is valuable though is, so that, that that's where the value, value of normal reference values come from. Um, the, but in terms of following patients over time, um, it is really their own, you know, the comparison of changes over time of their own that that, that is important, and we do that in you know with conventional pulmonary functions. I mean, we we talk about you know when we uh, talk about outcomes, we report, uh, we we discuss you know what their FEV one is in terms of predicted percent predicted, but really when we talk about the you know, calculations of CLAD or how patients are doing relative to to the baseline, we're really talking about the best values that those patients have achieved themselves in terms of their FEV and FEC values. Well, I guess at some level, uh, one benefit being a, a doctor looking at a patient with lung transplant, you know immediately what the, the disease is. You got a new lung, right? Uh, so, so the diagnosis is set from the start and then it's more a question of monitoring how it's developing you know, thinking about those um, four images you had up with different examples from different patients, it's kind of clear to me at least that the pattern is very different from patient to patient or from uh, time to time if it was the same patient. Uh, so I suppose that, that monitoring might be more important than the actual absolute number you're starting from. Is that correct? Yes, I, I think that's a very good, uh, that's correct. But I, I, you know, I also want to to sort of highlight the fact that, you know, it may be that if you have a very good graph from the very, like the initial measurements um, probably tells you whether or not your graph is, is good or not. Yeah. And, and could likely predict the outcomes in terms of what happens thereafter. Yeah. So uh, one question I have here, uh, which I think is kind of interesting and I think it's kind of impossible to answer at this time because you only have very limited time span of data here is that, do you think that early detection will increase the life of the transplant and subsequently the patient? Um, yeah, I, I can't answer that. I certainly hope so. Um, I, I think one of the, you know, one of the biggest, this is sort of like the holy grail of lung transplant um, because despite the fact that we've invested a lot in terms of the peri-op and post-op management, we've not really been able to budge the needle very much 
uh, in terms of survival. And, and really the, the major reason for it is you know, the, the, major, the main cause of death post-transplant is clot, uh, chronic lung neoglacial dis dysfunction. And, and part of it is that we, we can't diagnose it early. Uh, by the time it, the diagnosis is made, it's already well established, it's already irreversible because it's a diagnosis of, uh, of uh, retrospect, right? So we, we, have, we have to wait three, month, three months from the initial onset of the drop in the FEV1. And so we had an ability to actually identify clod even if we were able to that, make that, that diagnosis at the time of the FPV1 drop, there is a potential for us to actually intervene. Uh, but that, that's a, that's a long-term question um, and, and one that really can't be answered until we have follow patients um, and until over time and until we, we actually have an intervention study where care is directed by changes in the oscillometry. Um, I can see that. Um, I mean, longitudinal data is always gold in this cases, and we will see if we will move the needle past those six, seven years, you know, in the, the initial graph I showed. Um, I think time-wise, we are now actually coming up to the hour here uh, very shortly. If there's somebody who has a question, this is the last chance to submit it, um, and uh, uh, we, will, we will grab the opportunity to to, to um, ask Chang Wei about it. Um, so uh, one final question I have here, if nobody else is gonna ask it, uh, or another one is how big is the variability and what is the root of variability? Is the variability, is it coming from the device or is it the biology? Um, I, there, there's, there's biological variation um, as there is biological variation with spirometry. We've, We've actually looked at the biological variation in, in our cohorts and we, um, BioCALS is done as part of our pulmonary function lab, QA, QC, and oscillometry has been part of that QC um, procedure. And, and the, the biological variation of oscillometry in, for, sort of from the individual point of view uh, is comparable to that of spirometry. So, so I think that is very reassuring. Um, but I think that in, um, there are sort of systemic differences between devices uh, in terms of the measurements. So I think that at, for the time being, um, you know, if you're comparing values of a patient, it's important to actually do your, the measurements using the same device so that I, I don't think that we can compare you know, measurements made on the tremor flow with the MOS graph or with the iOS. Um, but but that because there are there there are um, and you are one of the uh, one of the co-authors on the paper, Leonard. We, we know that there are systemic biases uh, in terms of the different devices, and, and and the thing to do is to to recognize that and to to do your comparisons appropriately by using the, the same device for the measurements within the same patient. Okay, so I got one last question here. Uh, which uh, says, what vital information do we get from oscillometry for lung transplant patients, which we don't get from spirometry? I, I think the most, the, the take home message of that for today is that oscillometry tells you that there's a there's, there's graft injury and we don't get that information always. In fact, we, we usually don't get that information from spirometry until it's uh, a bit too late. Okay. Um, I think with this, I'd like to thank uh, Cheng Wei a lot for, for uh, uh, giving us her time today. And I hope that everybody got something out of this uh, webinar. And if you have any questions pertaining to oscillometry, a uh, question for Cheng Wei, you can feel, for, feel happy to, to forward them to us and we can forward them on to her unless you can find her email <laughs> online. Uh, and uh, just, just type in my name on Google. I, I, we, I've given up there. privacy uh, a long time ago when I, I, I started in academics. <laughs> yeah, I think as all, all academics, we are all, we're public figures more or less. Um, uh, anyway, if you want any information from, from uh, Thoracis, I put that up on the screen right now. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank everybody for logging on today. Uh, was happy being your host.
Yeah, thank you so much again, uh, Cheng Wei, for, for uh, uh, presenting and discussing. And I uh, hope to see you some other time on another webinar. So take care, everybody. Have a good rest of your week. Thanks, everyone, for coming out. Goodbye. Bye-bye.